And we are live. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. I've got Eric Kimberling with me. Eric just joined. I guess he was having some change management issues on the home front there. Uh, so, uh, so we have no idea what we're going to talk about, but actually we did exchange some notes about the impact of AI on digital transformation in the ERP and beyond. Should AI affect digital transformation? My answer is no. So this is the show, shortest show ever. Thank you for coming. Let's move on with our day. Um, but actually, the answer is a lot more complicated than that. I realize that. Uh, if you're on LinkedIn right now, uh, especially, please comment or any platform, but especially LinkedIn so I can know that your comments are coming through okay. Thank you. And I've been looking forward to this one. Hey, Thomas, how's it going? Nice to see you. I'm sure you're going to have a couple things to say about this before we get done. Uh, yeah, so um, so the reason I'm such a vociferous no is uh, when, when I wrote my AI projects pieces this year, I wrote two of them. The thinking behind that was basically that my belief that no technology, no matter how super whiz-bang cool, disruptive you think it is, is outside the scope of being subject to the metrics of what really delivers value for customers. So in that sense, the answer is obviously no, because every transformation should consider technology in the context of its stated goals. And no, AI doesn't make you throw those goals away. So absolutely not. I will accept no argument to that. Uh, Eric, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He just launched the grenade and uh, just yeah, had, yeah, yeah. Had me. <laughs> I mean, I realize it's a lot more complicated than that because AI actually can affect how we deliver projects and things like that. So uh, we're going to get to that stuff, but yeah, but it, yeah, I'm sure you can't disagree with that, right? I mean, every technology is subject to the customer's goals, ROI, expectations, value delivery. He, I, I'm so sick of reading like, oh, like uh, over on TechCrunch, I read some stuff, and this isn't Ron Miller's fault. He's just reporting on points of view of like. C CIO is saying, oh, we got to get in on AI because basically we can't fall behind. That's such a crappy reason for implementing yeah. a technology. I completely reject people who are saying that that's a wrong point of view. Oh, fear of being left out. It's like that, that that's like getting on a TikTok or something. Come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the FOMO argument. You know, I, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to be the last, the last guy or gal to adapt this software. But you're right. I mean, you've got to have, there's no business value there and you can't prove it and you can't measure it. Then you who cares? You know, you, you spend all this money and you can't, you have nothing to show for it other than just being able to tell people like, Hey, I'm using AI in my organization, or I'm an AI enabled or an AI driven organization, which I know everyone loves to say now, especially, you know, in the tech, the tech space. Right. So I, I agree with you on that. Yeah. And we're going to get into this much deeper. And by the way, uh, the reason I have Eric on the show for a couple different reasons, Eric talks with customers about this stuff all day long. Yeah. Uh, Third stage consulting, you can see a ton of blog posts by him and his team members on related topics. So, uh, so there's a lot of background here. But uh, Eric lately has touched on the issues of AI and in how this impacts all of this stuff. Because obviously, we do need to have have these conversations. So we are going to talk about AI, but I also want to talk, you know, more generally about the state of ERP and digital transformation in general. So I am going to go uh, broader than that. Everyone says it, says Thomas, how comes? Um, well, you know, because uh, everyone, well, I think there's a, there's a cynical answer and a good answer, right? I mean, the cynical answer is that it's, you know, that if you don't say these things like AI-driven organization, you appear to be out of the loop. I think the more constructive answer is that CXOs, whatever their role, CFO, CIO, whatever, are expected by their board to have answers to this question on what are we doing about this? And and I understand that, right? And 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 that that is also pressure from the outside, right? Because when when your consumers and customers are using these tools, you know, you you do have to do it, which is the difference between this and say blockchain or metaverse, where no one is knocking on your door saying, "What is your blockchain strategy?" Because all of our customers are using it. AI is obviously different. The adoption's been massive. People play around with these tools, and so that's my answer. I mean, what do you think, Eric? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's you've got to also look at where you are as an organization maturity wise, you know, because I, I mean, AI is really cool. And um, you kind of look at the jump just to let's let's just back up for a second. Let's talk to let's talk about a, yes. a modern cloud ERP system. Let's just say I'm not even thinking about AI. I just want to go implement. I want to get off my on prem system. I want to get in the cloud. That is such a pain in the ass for so many companies right now, not because it's bad or not because it, it can't be done, but just because it's such a big change. So you're going from here to here. And now that now you add AI to that 
and you're jumping to here. And if you if you don't even have a basic cloud system in place or sort of a, a, a semi modern platform that you're working from, then AI shouldn't even be part of the conversation. Um, we have a we have a client just to, to your point though, John. We have a client who uh, someone on the board who's on multiple boards. Someone on the board of this client said, "Hey, we need to." It's a manufacturing company. This person on the board says, "Hey, we need to we need to um, deploy AI." And the question came up of why it's like, well, everyone's doing it. We need to do it. We need to stay ahead. Just go do it. And that's a terrible reason. I mean, it's, it's just terrible direction uh, in that way. So I, I think what you're saying is right. There's just so much buzz around it. And it's kind of a blind, uh, a blinded buzz or a, a myopic buzz of like, like, let's back up and really think about, is that the next best thing for us? I mean, maybe we should just get our ducks in a row and get a more foundational core set of technology before we even start thinking about AI. So I want to run this by you too. In my, in my last piece on AI projects, I floated this idea of AI as an accelerant, which I think ties into what, you're, what you just said, which is, in other words, if you have your shit together and, and, and you're moving ahead with, you have a strong data strategy and a strong modernization strategy, then starting to apply AI into that strategy starts to look good to me. If you apply AI to a disjointed organization that is looking to reduce headcount, <laughs> get operating expenses under control, slash support costs, all this stuff, I think it's also an accelerant, but in a crappy way. So this is my point of view. And one of the reasons why I, I'm going back to this core concept that it doesn't really affect the core transformation disciplines you've been preaching all these years is that you got to get that stuff in a good place. And, and then we can really have a good AI conversation, right? I mean, is, isn't that how it's working? Yeah. And actually, uh, Thomas in the chat just said it spot on. You have to get, you got to get your data right. And if you don't have your data right, which I would argue organizations are way behind on this to begin with, they should have been doing this 10 years or more ago, you know, at least. And so many of them now are saying, oh, well, if we want to use AI, I guess we better clean up our data. <laughs> when you're like, well, why don't you just do it? Why don't you do that in the first place? But that's okay. You know, that, that's the past. But the point is, if you, if you don't have clean data, you don't have a data governance strategy, data management strategy internally, then you're wasting your time on cool technology that's just going to give you a lot of hallucinations and inaccurate info. Jason has an interesting point here. Ask yourself, does my organization have a larger elephant in the room than diverting valuable resources to AI? So, so right. So, so I'm sure when you're talking with organizations, there's like, a bunch of different factors and one of that could be like various pain points they're experiencing that need to be prioritized right cuz my impression of the of your view on transformation is that is that you kind of need both right you need immediate priorities but it's a mistake if you don't also have a broader plan on where this is all headed isn't that kind of how you think about it with clients yeah, I mean, it, most of the time companies when they make a big capital investment in new technology most of the time they're intent is to do so in the context of our broader business strategy. It's not just to go throw a bunch of money out there and let's go do some agile testing MVP type stuff and let's just see what happens. Usually that's not, I mean, you might do that at, at, on a smaller scale in isolation to sort of test out ideas or to you know, try some innovative processes or technologies and then scale it out. But you're, when you do do it, that should be more of an exception that's done in the context of a broader strategy. So I, I agree. If you, if you have a really clear and compelling business case, back to your opening comment, if you have a clear and compelling business case, and AI fits that and it somehow enables that, then sure, have at it, go, go for it. But if it's just, say, we need to do it, sort of like the, sort of like the, all the companies are scrambling right now to upgrade from, you know, legacy SAP or legacy Microsoft Dynamics. You know, they're doing it because they have to, because a vendor told them they have to or else they're not going to have support. And that's the reality. So in some cases you do have to, but if that's your only reason or your main reason, that's a terrible idea. You're, you're not going to have that clear direction and path forward on how, how are you going to do it? And the same goes for AI as well. Yeah, and what I have said to those types of vendors, and this doesn't just apply to Microsoft and SAP, but applies to any legacy concepts. I've said if you, if you know, just because you get that lift and shift to the modern thing, don't assume that you've won over that customer. That's just a technical upgrade. That is totally different than buying into your overall vision of transformation going forward. You know. To me, those are yeah. totally separate issues, and to conf conflate the two is a is a huge mistake. And and arguably, I think as you pointed out, a missed opportunity. Right, that when you get into scramble mode around deadlines for upgrades, I think you really run the risk of not really taking a harder look at how to modernize processes and how to really change your business for the better. And 
retrofitting that later is a huge pain in the ass, but that's probably a separate show. Um, listen, I want to um, tell, tell viewers what to expect here and, and why Eric's here. So one of the main reasons I have Eric here is because Eric is going to give me the straight deal for what customers want. Eric takes no vendor money. Got that? No vendor money. There's not that many people in this industry that can say that. So he's not going to be pitching you on various technology for the hell of it because that's not what he does. So anyway, so I think we're going to have a real talk today. And there's two things I really want to get into, which is honestly, how is his is AI impacting what he does and what he hears from customers? And then I want to also talk about the contrast between my recent cloud ERP benefits article that I put out in his thinking. So there's kind of like a two-part agenda. But we might as well start with, with AI, because you've been writing a lot about this lately. Oh, and, and by the way, I do want to say one thing. I have one quibble with Eric, which is I'm wishing you all the best in your business with one exception, which is TikTok. I don't no. want you to succeed on TikTok, because if you drag us all into TikTok to have B2B conversations there, that's going to be rough for me. I'm not ready for TikTok, man. <laughs> So I'm wishing you luck on everything else but that, okay? I've I've seen you dance. You're going to be great. (laughs) I've I've heard you sing. I've seen you dance. You're going to be perfect for TikTok. Oh, my God. Please, Eric. No, man. I mean, I kind of get it because you do a ton of videos, so I get why you would, you know, you're more prepared to take on TikTok than almost any other B2B person, but oh, my God, please, no. No! (laughs) Uh, I'll try my best. Sorry, that was just a detour, but um, okay. So, so talk to me about AI. I, I want to talk with, with you about how it's affecting your practice, but start with like the customers are. Are customers coming to you organically and raising this topic? And if so, in what context? What do they want from you around this? You know, there's a lot more, more than most technologies, I'd say there's a lot more um, hesitancy, you know, or, or not, not hesitancy. That's not the right word. There's a lot of interest. It comes up every day in, in client conversations, but it's more of a, um, uncertainty of what does it mean? Like, how are we, how are we really going to use AI? Do we go out and look at AI tools on our own is sort of standalone? Or do we just assume that whatever enterprise tech software vendor we're looking at, like a, an ERP vendor, for example, or a Salesforce or a HCM vendor, are they just going to build it in for us? And so there's that kind of uncertainty. And so a lot of times companies are saying, well, we don't really know what the hell we're going to do with AI, but let's include that as part of our digital strategy to at least assess and figure out what we might do with AI. And you know, our, our message to clients is don't do AI just because, just because everyone else is or because they think everyone else is. Because first of all, they're not. Um, there, there's a lot of interest in it, but I would say the average organization is not on the cutting edge of AI. You hear you know, NVIDIA is you know, super high of value and uh, has a huge valuation, is doing really well as an AI vendor. Other AI, um, other... Uh, Enterprise tech companies are investing very heavily in AI, obviously, but that doesn't mean it's right for you right now. It's good for them to stay ahead, and you know that's what tech companies do. They've got to be ahead of where we all are. So, um, so I think customers are looking at it as like, okay, this is kind of out here on the horizon, the, the not too distant horizon. We don't know what it means. We don't know how it fits into our overall tech stack. Let's figure that out as part of our digital strategy, and that's that's usually what we do. Now, when we do get into situations where that's the, when I just described a situation where we're working with clients who are just now defining their digital strategies for the next you know, three to five years. For clients that are already in the middle of an implementation, especially ones where we come in and we're sort of helping redirect and get it back on track because it hasn't gone well, AI is the last thing on their minds. I mean, they just aren't thinking about AI because they're just thinking, okay, how the hell do we get through this project unscathed? How do we get this new ERP system to go live? AI, you know, that's just da- too far out out of the realm of where we, we're in survival mode. We're just trying to get we're trying to get trying to get live on time on budget. We're trying to do it before the vendor cuts off support on the on the on prem system or whatever. So it, it's sort of a bifurcation of clients that that we see um, just based on the ones that reach out to us for help. Got it. Um, I derailed us into TikTok just a little bit. I'm a, we got to try to reel that back in. Marine's like looking for me on TikTok right now. Marine, here's the deal. If you see me on TikTok, don't post anything about that because I'm going to get freaked out if I'm on there because I don't have a channel, so I don't want to be on there right now. So um, don't don't say anything about it if you find it. Uh, I want to stay find focused. You. I'm going to film you right now, John. I've got my phone right here. We can oh, go live on TikTok right now man. if you want. <laughs> if you're going to post this on TikTok, we'll have to have we'll have a long conversation about that after. Anyway, um, so um, so Eric, let me let me put my Eric Kimberling hat on and tell you what I would tell customers. And then you tell me how close this is to what you tell customers, okay? So, sure. so 
a customer is coming to me, Eric Kimberling, to talk about my transformation and what the best strategy is. And AI is factoring into the conversation in two ways. Should I do my own AI initiatives? And should I, how should I do this in terms of vendors? So what I think I would say is this. I would say in terms of your own initiatives, I would say, do you have a sophisticated data science team? Are you sophisticated about AI regulations and privacy concerns, both in, in terms of the EUA Act and impending domestic regulations in the US? Are you sophisticated about all those things? Do you have a vision for how you could incorporate AI smartly into your so-called smart products? If the answer to that is yes, we can incorporate that into your transformation plans. I suspect the answer to all those being yes is going to be less than 1% of companies right now that you talked to, just a guess. And then on the vendor side, however, like I'm going to say, you do need to insert AI into how you evaluate vendors because every vendor says we've got AI. We need to understand exactly what that means in the context of that vendor and look at it from a pricing and liability standpoint as well, right? In terms of the vendor solutions, how are they going to be using my data? What is it going to cost? What can I expect? How does this change the value proposition? That's if I were Eric Kimberling, that's kind of what I would say. How close is that to your view? It's, yeah, it's spot on. I mean, the, the first of all, the 1% or less is accurate. And, and keep in mind too, I mean, I will caveat all this by saying you have to look at any sort of sample bias. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing clients that come to us because they need help. They don't have a lot of internal competencies and maturity, and that's why they're hiring a company like ours. So inherently, there's going to be a little bit of bias in the data or in, you know, in the clients we work with. But I think it's fair to say even ones that we talk to just, you know, through other peers and, you know, even companies that aren't potential clients, we always like to talk to people outside of our client base just to get a more complete view. Um, I don't know that many companies that are, that could answer yes to those questions. And for that reason, usually you say, okay, keep AI on your roadmap. You know, don't, don't just throw it out and say, we're going to ignore it, but don't get too excited and overinvest in it right now. Maybe let's, let's look at some innovative te- uh, use cases on how we might just at a micro level, start to test out AI, maybe in little pockets of our company. Once you find something that works then, and, and you've done um, sort of that agile approach of like just testing, getting feedback, seeing how it works, seeing how people might be able to use AI more effectively, then you can start to scale it across the company and say, okay, now we've got some use cases of how we can actually improve customer experience or, cust- or, or improve, improve our overall revenue or uh, increase profitability and, and efficiency, all those sorts of things. But, but just say, yeah, we're just going to blindly go write a check now for a you know, million dollars or whatever it is to go buy some AI software and we'll figure out later how we're going to use it. It's generally not a good idea, especially if you don't have those foundational pieces in place that you just described. The only thing I could see would be companies may need some advice and some expert consult on how to provide guidance to come to employees who may be using these tools in more of a shadow capacity, right? So there is a shadow AI problem, just like there's a shadow IT problem. And I think that's sort of a separate conversation to provide some guidance there to limit li- you know, IP and legal exposure, but that's a little separate too. I think our conversation today, Jason says, Eric, I'm sure you'll get your fill of AI next week at Cloud World. Anything you're looking for there with Fusion applications, Jason, a couple things. Uh, Eric won't be there, I don't think. Uh, I will no, actually, be. I will be there. Oh, no, I'll you, be there. Oh, will you? Awesome. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. so we'll both be there. All right. So um, all right. So I guess we can answer that question then. Uh, but I don't really want to get too far into Oracle today. So, but you can briefly answer that if you want to. Yeah, well, first of all, next week, it sounds like, is when John and I will be launching our joint TikTok channel. Um, so stay tuned oh, for excellent. that. Oh, excellent. From, <laughs> from the ground in cloud world. All right. right. I, I mean, surely all the kids um, will want to want to see that. Um, but anyway, no, but seriously, um, you know, I think with all these vendors, a part of the reason I'm going to more vendor conferences this year, I, I go to like, I try to go to like three or five a year. But this this year, I've been particularly excited about going is just to hear kind of where what vendors are thinking about, like what what are those areas, those hot spots or those hot buttons that they see as the most important to build into their into their uh, functionality? I will say it's a lot of PowerPoint decks that talk a lot about AI, but as far as when you're actually going to see some of this AI stuff, it's it's you know it's, it's a lot slower moving than what you can put together on a PowerPoint as, as far as a vision. So I'm just looking to see you know how does Oracle yeah, you know, how's Oracle looking at AI any differently than other vendors, especially with their, um, you know, all their um, analytic tools and some of the the, the reporting BI uh, types of tools that Oracle is known for? I'm I'm curious to see sort of how they're embedding AI, maybe leveraging AI in a different way than some other vendors do. 
So um, I wouldn't say there's anything uh, earth shattering I'm looking for here. It's just more, you know, where does Oracle see the see the priorities? Got it. And I'll be there. I'm on the analyst track and I'll go to the user event too. And uh, I got a lot of the same questions. Um, sorry, Jason, that I'm not getting too far into that yet, but I, I kind of want to wait and see what they have to say next week. But what, what I will tell you is that what I told them this week was I'll be looking for actual like customer examples. And this is like what I've told all vendors. This is not unique to Oracle, but I don't want to spend the fall kicking the can down the road on what's next with AI. Um, I'm expecting to hear a lot of vendors prop- propagandize AI agents from the keynote stage. And agents can be useful, although they're difficult to define. But I don't want, that's not an excuse for, it's time to hear from some customers on how this is impacting value. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. And actually, I think there's some sessions to that effect next week. So I'm going to try to hit those. So I'm kind of done with like hearing about what's coming. I'm ready to hear about what's working now. So that's kind of my mentality for all these shows this fall, including Cloud World, but everything else I'm going to as well, including Workday Rising and Dreamforce the following week. Are you going to either one of those, Eric? I am not. Uh, okay, you're skipping those. Okay. Yeah, I've but got an you... Infor event I'm going to. Oh, you're going to the uh, Infor event. I, I have okay. IFS and then this one. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Well, you, you're I've... getting out a little more. That's cool, man. We're going to see each other on the event circuit. This is this is good. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll be filming right. next week, too. If you want to show up in one of my, not for TikTok, don't worry. Well, we'll end up on TikTok because we just take the <laughs> YouTube stuff and we chop it up and put it out on TikTok. But awesome. for my YouTube channel, I'll be filming next week. So if you want to make a cameo. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'd love to chat with you. Excellent. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see. You're going to probably need a little detox after these vendor keynotes because you haven't been exposed in a while. So it's going to be interesting to regroup from that. Um, yeah. Thomas, um, AI is pretty much a ru- AI is pretty much a running target. How do you define it? I'd like to avoid a long semantic discussion today, Thomas. Um, there is like a worthy conversation about how 95% of what we call AI isn't actually remotely like intelligent and doesn't really adhere even to the classic definitions of what machine learning is, which is really just one form of AI anyway. I really don't want to do that today, but just for the short version, like I think we could look at it as the more sophisticated end of the automation spectrum, as well as, you know, in gen AI context, a different way of kind of engaging users around uh, interaction with, with data and, you know, predictive concepts and all of that. But I don't know if I really want to like actually define it. Um, that would I think that would be a losing proposition. Anything you would add, Eric? Yeah, I would just say I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a running target. I'd just say there's so many different ways you could use AI that it's overwhelming. And so I, I think that's where, in my mind, I I would I might think it's a running target or moving target, but it's really just there's so many different potential use cases. You've got to narrow it down, figure out what's right for you. Yeah, there's a firm called Cognolytical Cognolytica that um that um, defines like six different patterns of AI, which is interesting. If you have a chance, if you're interested in that, I think that's an interesting conversation to look at the different patterns. They talk about things like personalization, predictive. I think that's an interesting way to slice and dice it. Uh, I don't have the six patterns in front of me, so I'm not going to recite them at the moment. Um, Jason, surprise, guess it could happen. Um, stratosphere to be announced, uh, but uh, I have the invite, so we shall see. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So, so let's talk about this in, in the context of your own practice, because you have written about this a little bit. And I did see that you, one thing that I thought you did was pretty cool is that you used AI to comb all your literature on digital transformation and you had it picked out the most important like factors. So you wrote a post about that, but let's, let's kind of be honest here, like to what extent is AI really impacting your work with clients? To what extent is it adding value? Are you experimenting with it? What What's going on there? Yeah, well, it's, you know, like a lot of people, it's the key words, experimentation, like you said, like you said, we're experimenting. So, you know, it's whether it's uh, trying to get better insights from notes that we've captured from clients or workshops that we've recorded, um, which, you know, that's kind of like the low hanging fruit for what we do is if we record a team's meeting, a, you know, a two or three hour workshop where we're diving into business processes and um, going over results of process mining and things of that nature, we'll, we can use AI to summarize and sort of pick out the, pull out the salient points. And it's a great way to not only be more efficient so clients aren't paying for us to do some of this grunt work that in the past they would pay high rates for, 
we're sort of speeding that up. And that's also giving us another set of eyes and ears, you know, through AI that without having to hire another body. So it's, I, I think there's a lot of value that we're starting to see, but it's on a real micro scale. I mean, I think the potential, the way we'll use it in two or three years is probably going to look totally different than how it is today. But that's just some low hanging fruit stuff is like analyzing notes, analyzing meetings, um, some of that real heavy, you know, grunt stuff that we would do in consulting. We're trying to find ways to do more and more automation of that and just get more sophistication behind it. We just had a rant on Diginomica from Chris Milton around the flaws in a meeting summary that he received where the, some of the information was incorrect. So it's interesting to grapple with some of that as far as just understanding that, you know, this, this isn't like, you know, perfection when it comes to that stuff. But I have talked with a lot of folks and I've been fairly impressed myself with some of the abilities to break out a longer document and say, here's the five key points or whatever. I think some of that can be pretty useful as long as you're aware that sometimes it can go off the rails a little bit or miss something that it doesn't think is important that actually turns out to be really important. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it, you know, and I don't know if you found this just given what you do at Diginomica and um, all, all the writing you do, but it's helped tremendously in, in my writing. So I can, I feel like I'm a lot more prolific now that I've got AI. I don't have to write every single word myself. And in fact, in most cases, I just take a YouTube video that I already filmed. I have my rough thoughts in that video and I ask it to write a blog about it. And I, you know, I went from spending an hour, hour and a half every week writing a 1200 word blog for the last 12, 13 years to now I spend half an hour cranking out three blogs a week. So, it, you know, just based on existing content. So it's, it, you know, sort of, so I could see it helping people scale, especially those that have to write a lot, analyze a lot. And people like you and I, others that are watching here, I think there's a lot of good use cases for it. And obviously Bonnie, Bonnie tends to agree with that as well. Bonnie sees it for documentation summaries. I, I think that is definitely a big thing. Like, for example, talking with Boomi uh, CEO, Steve Lucas, this week on a yet-to-be-published article talked about how of their so-called AI agents, the one around documentation has been one of their most popular. And I think there, there's a lot to be said for that brute force work around documentation that has been really difficult for organizations to, to do in the past. So I definitely see value there. Um, the writing stuff... I mean, that, that could derail our entire conversation if we got into all of that. Um, Diginomica officially has a ban on AI-generated writing for our writers, and it's a, it's a reader trust issue for us. Um, but I don't knock that some people like have good experiences with it. Like For me, I have a lot of trouble with it because I, I got a really, really high standard for what I want to write about with prose. And every article I write, I want it to be the best article on the subject ever written, which is, of course, not achievable, but that's my goal. And I, I can't de-jargonize the crap I get from these AI tools for that purpose. It takes, it takes me more time. Um, yeah. but, but that's a totally different use case that I described than, than a documentation scenario. So yeah. that's why I think we all have to experiment with these tools on our own terms based on our own. There's no universal standard to what's going to work or not. But I will say that I do think my argument for exceptional content is potent because the more commoditized content, the more easier it gets to create content, the more exceptional content I believe is going to stand out from the noise. But that's a kind of a different discussion than, than you know, some of these core documentation use cases. Bonnie you're says, of, you're, sorry to interrupt you, you're touching on something really important though, which is you're, you're humanizing, the way you write is something that is really hard to replicate with AI. The way I write is fairly vanilla. You know, it's not, uh, I'm not getting, uh, you know, you've got a lot of inner, uh, humor snarkiness yeah, yeah you know yeah, a lot of yeah, you, yeah. you're been a lot you can't I don't, as far as i know i don't think you can teach ai to write like you um so that's, mine's a little that's bit what i'm right. trying to do <laughs> so that so that human factor though i think it's i don't want to be really replaced good. by a machine eric man i just don't want that um yeah don't do, i'm don't not do it. i'm not ready to i'm not ready to busk on the street corner my guitar skills are not up for that challenge um yeah yeah bonnie says knowledge transfer is challenging and ai is a huge aid here and and honestly, we could probably have another show just on the potential impact of AI on so-called implementation implementation services. I'm really interested in that, Eric, because and I know you don't get into a lot of that stuff yourself as more as advising customers on that, but I'm interested in that because you can imagine how pre-populating systems with standard industry configurations and stuff and then helping users query around that and translating that business user objective into configurations and stuff. You can see how the impact on implementation services could be quite strong. 
oh yeah, like all this development work that is done, being done offshore for by by a lot of vendors and SIs. You know, you can bring a lot of that not in house, but just you know through through AI have it kind of automate some of that. And Jason just read my mind, huh? I didn't even see that in the chat yet, but um, will AI find a sweet AI find a sweet spot in reducing timeline cost and risk in the ERP implementation space? I think to a point it will for for some of the like reasons of just getting caught up in in bog pits of manual stuff that that honestly should have been automated a long time ago. But Eric, in terms of like risk and stuff, I'm not a hundred percent sure about all the risk reduction things because when I and I've read a lot of your project failure articles over the year, and a lot of these things feel like things that AI couldn't have prevented. They feel like all too human failures, to be honest with you. Yeah, because they until AI maybe starts making all the project decisions for you, in which case you, you're still at risk. But maybe maybe it catches some of these human errors that we tend to make as humans that are running these projects. Um, until that happens, it, it, AI is not going to reduce time, cost, and risk. I mean, you, you, yeah, you're going to reduce some of the, like I was saying before, you're going to reduce some of the time spent on some of the grunt, lower value added type work. But that's not really what derails a project. What really derails a project is the executives aren't on the same page. They're not communicating well to their team. You know, it's all the stuff that AI is not going to fix unless you find a way to tell AI to help you do those things. But it takes the human recognizing that I need to do this. We're not aligned as a team. Or we should probably have a better, more refined digital strategy and business case before we just start jumping in and doing stuff. So all these human errors that we make and that organizations keep making repeatedly over decades of having done this ERP stuff and enterprise tech stuff, AI is not going to fix that anytime soon. Yeah. If I could put a banner up on our thing, it would be that AI can't fix broken leadership and it's not going to anytime soon, folks. Um, and AI can't fix culture problems either. AI can't fix political infighting. AI can't fix teams, cross-cultural teams that can't get along on and on and on. Nor can AI, I don't think, fix multinational global collaboration problems between teams either. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, Thomas says that he can imagine an AI helps when it comes to customization coding. And certainly, I think we're going to see some efficiencies around coding. AI is, I think, actually even better for coding than it is for for writing because writing arguably has exceptionalism around artistic qualities. Coding often does not. And coding has very strict syntax, kind of like specialized writing does, like screenplays. And AI excels at syntax, right? So if you want to write a screenplay, AI is going to reduce a lot of your time because it's going to put all the syntax in there for you. The exit stage left, all that stuff is going to go in automatically. Same thing with coding. It's going to put all that stuff in. You can have other AI agents that debug the code to an extent. So like, yeah, but the problem with that is that who decided what you're going to code, who decide what you're going to build mm. and why it doesn't make those decisions and won't anytime soon. I hope to God. So, so there's a lot that I think is beyond the scope of AI. And that's one reason why I think we need to kind of keep our BS detectors really sharp this fall. Cause we're going to hear a lot. We're going to hear a lot of that from the keynote <laughs> stage. And, uh, we need to be aware that this is a tool, not, not something that is going to, you know, save our trouble projects from themselves. So anyway. yeah, agreed. AI can't fix people. Yeah. If, if only Jason. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting. I, do you have anything more to say on that topic? Cause I want to ask you a little bit more about overall benefit stuff, anything more on AI and the impact on your work and stuff. No, I think just to that last comment, though, AI can't fix people and also building and piggybacking on what you said. I mean, even if you could use AI, let's just say, theoretically, you could use AI to get the bad decisions turned into good ones and you could fix leadership, all this stuff. Even then, like you still, you have the rest of the organization now to to help them through the change. And AI is not going to help do that. What's going to help do it is by humans showing people how the processes work, selling them on the idea and the vision for what it is they're trying to accomplish all that stuff. So it's just, I think that last comment from Jason just further underscores the point we're making here along those lines. You know, Eric, one thing I am really interested in, and and I think it'll be interesting to see this play out in time, but I think it's something you've written about a lot, which is sort of like engaging business users on projects and getting them more involved in and a sense of ownership over things. And I'm really interested to see in the generative AI context how much that can help, right? Because 
There's been kind of a low-code, no-code type of movement for a while. But I think it's really interesting to think about a concept where a business user could tell an AI prompt, I want to build this kind of thing. Can you build it for me? And to have some level of specifications developed around that, which obviously would then need to be vetted with your you know, tech team and stuff like that. But I think it's really interesting, this concept of like extending that in, you know, because look, we've been talking about the so-called democratization of data in the enterprise for a long, long time now. And I think we've achieved it only to a modest degree because we built more user-friendly tools and interfaces. But for the most part, it's still been elusive. And I, I served as a judge on, uh, you know, one of these things this summer around data, data and decision-making. And the Gen AI stuff honestly didn't demonstrate a lot of proven value yet, but that's part, partly because it's, let's face it, the tools are kind of immature for that purpose. But the whole thing around where the value was perceived, a lot of it was around, we can extend this data much more easily to our business users now who are not savvy with manipulating analytics environments, um, and, and they can kind of engage in a more user accessible way. I think that's interesting to watch, right? Is like, to what extent can this engage more business users in conversations around data in the direction of the business and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and you were talking earlier about how you what you're looking for forward to at some of the vendor shows is are those customer case studies and use cases of how they're using AI. I was actually at a really good customer panel at an Infor event a few months ago this year, and there they had a really good customer panel where they talked about those things. They talked about what it took for them to be able to be able to use AI and what some of the challenges were. They talked about specific ways that they were using AI and, the, and ways they, they had sort of rolled out incremental AI capabilities. So I think you're right. I mean, if, you, if you've got, um, b- back to your earlier point, if you've got benchmarks or examples that you can see from other companies and how they're using AI, and you can translate that into something measurable within your organization, um, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good first start. And, and you also have to recognize, though, back to your earlier point, too, which is what is that foundational stuff? What's your plan to get there? What, what stuff do you have to have as a prerequisite before you can really take advantage of some of these AI capabilities? Unfortunately, vendors translate this and put on the, the sexy marketing team. And yeah. now it's AI is the new, new UI, which is a total bullshit overreach. Sorry, yeah. that's not yeah. happening anytime soon. I'm sorry. Your super users care about their screen navigations. Sorry, this isn't going to you're not going to try taking that away from them. Have fun. Have fun with that. Yeah. Ha- have fun with that. So sorry, I had to, had to take a knock there. So these are the two things we're going to hear a lot this fall is AI is the new UI and agents are going to change your world someday. We don't have it today, but it's going to happen soon. So anyway, vendors, please don't do this. Please just show us cool stuff that your customers are using now. That would be really awesome. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so let, let's talk about this whole ERP modernization thing, because I think this is interesting because you you talked about this earlier, and you've written a whole bunch about ERP and digital transformation over the years. And uh, in my art, in my recent article on cloud ERP benefits, I linked to one of yours, and then I just saw that the link reverts to your LinkedIn homepage. So I need to go fix that after you and I talk today. But what I did is I linked to a really good overview article that you wrote, uh, which is uh, and if if anyone wants to do a search on it, it was called. Um, the System for Digital Transformation and ERP Implementation Success. And this is on my Diginomica piece at the bottom where I wrote about extracting value from cloud ERP and what I call a customer-first world and how does AI change that. I think we've covered a lot of the AI parts, but my thesis in this article is that is that SaaS cloud ERP vendors are kind of overstating the benefits that are accrued by the initial go-live. And there, there are some real benefits there, like simplifying your system's landscape, more affordable deployments, more frictionless consumption of new functionality, a better user experience. So those, those things are real and they do happen at go live. But for the most part, my view is that most of the real potent benefits of cloud ERP happen after go live and don't happen automatically. They happen when, when vendors and their clients and their advisors work together and say, Hey, you got to keep pushing because there's a lot more here you can benefit from. And so the art in the article, I lay out a whole bunch of what I perceive those benefits to be, including automating workflows, you know, reallocating labor into higher value tasks, making better decisions with real time data, a whole bunch of stuff. But what I keep telling people is that doesn't just happen. 
you have to push. And this is in honor of my dear friend, Michael Doan, RIP, uh, my brother, but he was, he preached, you know, early in SAP days, he was all about go live is just a flip of the switch. This is not the end. This is the beginning. So I want to know how does those, how do those views reconcile with all of all of the things that you've studied about transformation in ERP? Well, I think, first of all, it's 100% spot on. It doesn't happen automatically, as, as Maureen says on the chat here on LinkedIn. Uh, it doesn't happen automatically. It, it usually happens after go live. It usually happens because you've optimized and really figured out how to use the technology and sort of built up your muscle memory around it. Um, I think the problem, though, the really interesting human behavior that I don't know how to fix, to be honest. It's really hard to overcome, even with our clients when they hire us. It's like you get you get to a go live and say you're doing three phases. You've got three major phases of a project. You get through the go live of phase one, and all you want to do is just get on to phase two. Let's just get going so we don't fall behind at phase two. Right. We're not thinking about optimizing phase one. Like, hey, let's let let's let this sit and percolate for a little while. Let's get let's build up that muscle memory. Let's let's get conditioned to use this system the way we could. Let's refresh our training. Let's optimize and you know configure however we need to. And, and learn from it, and, and and organizations just don't have the the um, the tolerance or the patience to do that. And I, it's really fascinating to me because there's so much value you get out of that. I mean, that's really right where you connect the dots, you know, between the vision that vendors are selling you and what you actually get. You know, those are two different things if you don't connect those dots. I think some of the common ground we have here is around maturity models and how important it is to develop those. And I know you've developed a number of blog posts around like what maturity and digital transformation looks like. Uh, and then I really am pushing vendors to put out their own versions of that publicly that are industry specific, ideally, that kind of show because I think breaking down those steps is so important. And especially if you can now put high performing customers on the stage that have achieved some of those things to give you both that vision of, oh my God, like we could really be doing some of these things, but also what the steps are, right? Because if you don't have some steps to make it manageable, then I think it's really, really tough, right? To Because it's so hard to imagine transforming your organization overnight to reach that point. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 so true. And I think there is a, a faulty mentality or a flawed mentality that people have, which is it will happen overnight, which is not true. So yeah, Maureen's blowing up in the chat. So let's let's get to this because I think this is this is good. So um, we'll start with Bonnie Tinder. Sometimes the most value is delivered when a customer says they're leaving and everyone gets serious about making sure the system utilization is increased. That's true. And Bonnie, that's my whole thing is I don't want to reach that point because by that time, there's a lot of pain and suffering that I really don't think we need. Uh, Maureen, uh, the market still believes all the tech is plug and play and is stubborn about the human work on all sides and needs to go into it to make it happen. Uh, Marine continues, we've overemphasized the tech and are super undervaluing the human side and it's costing us. Um, Jason says, Marine, too many people, executive and leadership teams included, just want to pay for the light switch. So Eric, comment on that that kind of fleshes out what we were talking about. Yeah, it's that, it's that easy button, um, even though it's not an easy button you're holding. What is, what is that, a, a BS button or something that you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my, like, it's my bullshit detector. Oh, BS there. detector. Okay, I've seen yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, there's also the easy button version of that too. Yeah. Um, it looks a lot like an easy button, does it? Yeah. It does, which is which is great. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, executives want that. You know, they want that easy button, and that's why some of the that's why vendors message things the way they do. They're they're speaking to executives. You know, they're speaking to executives by saying, "Hey, this is a flip of the switch," and uh, look at all these great AI capabilities. If you don't adopt AI, you're falling behind. All your competitors are doing it. You're going to die out. You'll be dead in five years if you don't invest in AI now. That sort of mentality gets a, it, it works with executives. The problem is that it doesn't work with reality. So executives get on board, they buy the software, and then it's usually someone else at a lower level that's tasked with now go make this happen, which usually begins and ends with unrealistic expectations, a, a you know, flawed budget, flat, flawed strategy, unrealistic implementation plan, all that stuff. So I, I agree. So Eric, I think you did a good job of calling me out a little bit there around the fact that part of what I'm preaching is a little idealistic, right? That that in the real world, people get caught up in these phases you described and, and, and it's this kind of treadmill and then it's back to business as usual. And that's kind of the reality of a lot. Um, so I, I do recognize that I'm pushing on an issue that a lot of folks don't 
totally want to take on. Um, there, there's a couple things that I have a couple of cards up my sleeve to help push this. You tell me if this resonates at all. One of mine is that they need folks like you on projects that are independent, that can provide a little bit of perspective and a nudge on this stuff, right? Um, because I think they don't always get that from their status quo relationships with vendors who may be more than happy to take on legacy workloads and continue just billing the client. So, um, so I think they need folks like you that can stand back and say, hey, are you aware that if you did this, this, and this, you could get a lot more out of your system than, than what you're doing now? So I think that's number one. Number two, I think customer success methodologies are part of, part of my argument, which is that everything should be shifting to these more annualized agreements that are not about permanent lock-in, but are about, I work with you for now, I measure the success of that, and then I see where it goes from here. And you know, you know, yes, there is some level of SaaS lock-in that is still a reality, just like on-premise. It didn't totally change by any means, but I think it's a little bit easier to move off of certain SaaS. And I think what I would say to cloud vendors is that you're not locked in unless vendors love the value they're getting from your software. If, if they don't love it, you're not totally, you don't have them totally under control because another cloud vendor can come along and, and pull certain workloads away from you with a better value proposition. You are not set in stone just because it's cloud. This is part of what I want cloud ERP vendors to understand is that your workloads are still vulnerable in the future unless customers are really bought in and it's not just about adoption. So what I'm pushing for is more to translate that customer success mentality into real-time visibility into projects. So that's the obvious next step. We have personal health watches for our wrist to monitor our watches. Why don't we have that for our projects, right? And, and someday, I would argue, folks like yourself should have that same visibility into your clients so that the vendor, the partner, and even an advisor like you should be able to look at the same information and be able to ask questions and say, hey, I noticed that this level of, of engagement is going down in this area. Why do you think that is? Or, or this region seems to be proceeding slower than this in a rollout. Why would that be? And suddenly, we're having this more real-time conversation because when I read your project failure articles, the one thing that always comes back is why did it take one year or two years to wake up and realize something was going wrong? So, right. so, so react to all of that. Yeah, that's a, that's a big uh, can of worms there you're opening up, but, it, but it's yeah, very yeah. relevant. It's, it's super relevant because, first of all, um, you know, you, you, I'll maybe answer this backwards, starting with the most recent thing you said. So like it, vendors, unfortunately, software vendors and system integrators don't find it to be in their best interest to do what you just said for for them to point out the risks and the problems it it runs counterintuitive to their kool-aid drinking that they've been yep. trained on I, i'm trained if i'm a sales vendor or a software vendor or an si i'm drinking the kool-aid i am bought in i'm all in on whatever the platform or technology is anything that runs counter to that it, it just doesn't resonate with me and so i'm gonna dispute that and that's why i get a lot of flack from the vendor community when i say stuff like hey cloud in many cases in most cases is more expensive longer term than on-prem. And vendors hate when I say that. They've hated that from day one, they still hate it today. But I, I say it not because I wanna be an a-hole or a pain in the ass, I say it because it's true. But the problem is I'm not, to your point earlier, I'm not selling software. I don't care if a vendor does or doesn't make a sale based on something I say, but they do. So they're gonna constantly resist that realistic view of the world in the name of sort of putting that spin on it that they need to be able to sell and speak the language that executives yes. wanna hear. So that's the real human psychology and sociological side of our industry. And I think that's what's really broken, honestly. If I could go back and trace it like one flaw in our industry, it's because there's not enough objective, independent voices that are saying, hey, hold on, you're a 200-year-old industrial manufacturing company that has failed miserably in past changes. What makes you think now in 18 months, you're going to jump to the cloud with AI-enabled capabilities? It's not going to happen. So guess what? That's okay. Don't do it. <laughs> Just do something more incremental. Make some pro forward progress. You don't have to go at the same speed as everyone else. And that sort of that that I think back to your first question, or your first point is that that alignment and that alignment with who you are and who you're trying to be as an organization that is super important. And that that's really the filter that more vendors and system integrators and technical types should be thinking about their projects and, and the way they're servicing their their clients. And when risks come up and you find that, hey, this is misaligned or we're moving a lot slower than we thought, instead of trying to cover it and say, well, 
yeah, 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 this is normal. Yeah, we failed the first round of testing miserably and we're six months behind schedule. But that's fine. We'll make it up in the next phase. And they end up doing this dance with the executives and the, and the client that, that convinces the customer that everything is going to be fine. And then a year or two years go by, to your point, and suddenly you're, you, you say, hey, time out. This is a complete disaster. But it's, it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a frog in boiling water a lot of times because you keep hearing the same stuff from the vendor community that's all positive. It's all sunshine and rainbows until it becomes painfully, it becomes painfully clear that it's not. Because you have that same experience, right? Writing about these project failures, I would think, don't you have that same reaction I do when you're documenting these? Because a lot of people may yeah. not know that you also serve as like an expert witness in these situations. But isn't so much of it like, what the hell? Like, why didn't, <laughs> did, did everyone just get, was it a lobster boil where everyone just like died along the way and there was no one left to say the water's hot? Because it feels yeah. like so many times these things could have been nipped in the bud with someone raising their hand sooner and saying, I think we have a problem here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you would think, but um, doesn't but happen. Again, doesn't. But when you've got, yeah. you've, let's say you're a company, you've got a hundred people from one of the big four consulting firms on your project, and you've got a big vendor like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft. They're telling, you, hey, everything's great. Don't worry, you've got our A team. This is normal. Things things you know get a little turbulent at times, but everything's going to be fine. You know, when you've got that many voices repeating the same thing, drinking the same Kool Aid, it. it it's, it, it creeps in, it seeps into the client's mentality too. And I think that's part of the problem. And, it, and the it, vendor doesn't have to do this long-term. The, the client does. That's the, that's the painful part. Vendor's going to be long gone when you're feeling the real pain of what you're doing right now. And that's- 100%. That's okay. I want to get back to that long gone statement in just a minute. Um, just real quick to catch up on the chat. Marine's saying, great idea on the watch analogy. Also, the tech platform should have that. I've written a couple pieces on customer success on Diginomica where I get into that further. And Maureen, by the way, one of my other little rants is, why don't you sick your AI on that problem? Where are the AI demos on those issues? Um, they're not forthcoming at this time. Uh, Bonnie says, I love some device like they have at the airport where you could daily rate your project satisfaction. Absolutely. Um, this is what I'm talking about, these real-time views. Now, Eric, I laid so much on you in that last segment. I want to break it apart a little bit more. So going back to the independent part, one of the objections that I get when I push this independent voices thing and independent experts on project is that that adds to the political tensions of a project. And I, my response to that is I don't deny that that's possible, right? Because obviously that's disruptive to the prime vendor and the cozy relationship they have with the customer when there's someone who's not part of that financial transaction saying, Hey, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't just be doing these custom builds all day long because that is a form of technical debt. Uh, maybe you should look at some standardization around processes that are not differentiated. Uh, that would be one of the things I'd be saying on a lot of these ERP projects, for example. Um, so how do you reckon with that? Like, do you un encounter that objection? And like, how do you deal with that political objection thing? Yes, I we deal with that a lot, especially, you know, the bigger the client and the bigger the SI, the more common it is because these, you know, I won't mention names on here for obvious reasons, but you you know who they are, the big, the big four guys and gals and the you know, large tier system integrators. Yep. They're really good at, at you whispering in the ears of the executives and that cozy relationship you you talk about. The political tension they refer to, the political tension they don't like is calling out reality. Yep. They don't like they don't like reality because reality hurts. It sucks. It, it you know these are these are painful projects. Your your software is not perfect. Your team that you put on this project is not perfect. If for someone to call that out and say, hey, here's a risk or here's a problem we have or hey, Mister Miss uh, Si, you think you can do this in eighteen months, but this client is not going to do anything remotely close to that even in thirty six months or whatever it is. So it's us calling it out, and then you think about it like it, it's almost like a, a an animal in a corner. When you start getting someone on the outside like us that says, hey, John, I know you work for big four consulting firm, insert name here, um, and I know you want to get all your revenue in 18 months because if you do the implementation in 18 months, you're going to get that revenue sooner. I'm saying, no, let's throttle that back to a lower run rate, spread it out over three years. I'm threatening your, your profit, and, and therefore, you are going to fight me tooth the nail and say, you are wrong. You know nothing about this project. I have other clients that have done this and that and blah, blah, blah. And we're not, and again, we're not, it doesn't do us any good to be a pain in the ass. It, it does us good to only be paid by our clients and represent their interests and do what's best for them. And sometimes that's not what's best for the vendor. And that's the political tension that I think they refer to is, yep. it, to me, it's not yep. political tension, it's reality. But, 
Right. But here's the thing. It's not what's best for the vendor because their business model is still broken. If their yes. business model wasn't broken, then the win for the customer would be directly aligned with the win for them. So here is my yeah. three here is my three part proposal for you on how we're gonna not necessarily change the industry, but have a little more success around this topic. Number one is we're gonna take customer success and we're gonna apply what I call the customer success buzzword boomerang effect. And we're gonna use that topic to turn it around on the vendor and the client to say, what does customer, what does success look like? What metrics are we gonna measure? And let's agree upon those metrics and what those are. And let's review those on a regular basis. And then we're gonna use that to start pushing for real-time monitoring of that through various kinds of dashboarding or whatever. And then we're gonna ask the vendors to put their AI on the problem and start alerting us all the time when we're going astray so we don't even have to check a friggin' dashboard. We're just gonna get alerts saying, hey, you know, you're, you're venturing into some project failure characteristics here on your project. Can we turn this around for mutual benefit? So this is my evil plan. What do you, what do you think? I, I like the evil plan. I think it's not so evil. Um, it's very disruptive, but not so evil. I, I might add to that too. This is again, a little more, I'll admit, draconian and maybe unrealistic, um, but you could say, you know, the, some of these vendors um, and system integrators, especially are, are too big. You need to bust them up. You need to keep them separated. You need to, um, you know, not have, not let them have so much leverage and control over vendors. And when I say let them, I mean, it's really the customers that are letting them, but they, a lot of times they don't know better. Um, but I think, you know, there should be some limitation on how much revenue an SI can make off of a, off of a customer, same with the, the software vendors too. So right. that's, no one's going to like, no one's going to like that from the, from the vendor community, I'm assuming, but that is yeah. an option too. If you can, if you break it up a little bit to where you've got smaller, more reasonably sized players, a little hungrier, scrappier, and nimble, uh, I think they're going to, that, that might A hundred percent. And I would point out that that um, regulatory oversight of all of this is is not off the table and is a different conversation and one that I personally welcome, though I'm also mm -hmm. conscious that there's treacherous aspects to that conversation also. But I do think it's relevant that I don't think all of this is not solved by smart business practices, and I'm not trying to imply that it is. But I do believe that that there are ways of being smarter and having truer longer-term wins that are in everyone's best interest. And so that's like kind of what I'm pushing today uh, more than anything. But but yeah, I, I agree with you, Eric. And I think it would, be, it would be interesting to be able to have those conversations. And the other ancillary point that I'm always making with customers when I talk with them, uh, you know, they'll put me in a room and be like, ask me anything or whatever. And like, it'll be like, cast a wider net with your prime vendor also. Because like a lot of times, like these specialist players are so worth looking at in various deployments and industries now where there's there's like SWAT teams of experts that understand your industry better maybe than this big vendor, or maybe they have another development approach, or maybe there's someone like Marine that can help you talk about thorny data problems that your your big vendors can't, you know, like, so to me, like casting a wide net is really important. And I know that customers struggle with this still because they have all these things around, oh, but bringing a vendor on is so tedious and there's all this paperwork and the approvals and the, it's like, I get that. But part of what you need to do then is to streamline that process and to figure out yeah. how to make that easier and not just to accept, oh, well, it's hard because we have a legacy procurement process. Well, maybe fix that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe and that, start there. And that problem is a lot easier to navigate than the problem on the flip side, which is project gets out of control, com creates a complete disaster for your organization. You, you can't ship product when you go live, can't close the books, can't pay people. That's a much bigger problem to solve than setting up a new vendor or a couple new vendors in your in your uh, procurement process. Indeed. And, uh, and in fact, Bonnie and I are speaking on a panel later this uh, fall about this. And Bonnie uh, does a ton of research on like third party uh, services integrators and you know how they perform well and what the keys to success are. So a lot of the people in the chat today are experts in this domain, well worth looking into. Um, and none of them are my business partners, so that's a shameless plug for all of them. Um, but 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 one of the reasons I have such a passion for for people like that is because because you know when you're a small upstart player, you, you have to work harder and you have to rethink. And I think we're in dire need of imagination around all of this stuff. So yeah. what, 
so so Eric, on top of everything else that you do, and you and you're a massive content proliferator, and I know AI is helping you a little bit, but still, you're you're blasting it out. You also have books, so you have one book done and one on the way. So, what can you tell us about your book projects? Yeah, so I have a book out called The Final Countdown, um, which you can buy at thefinalcountdown.com, or you can just go to Amazon and search for it. You can buy it electronically or a hard, co- uh, hard copy. That was a book about digital strategy and how to define a digital strategy. Uh, my next book is going to be uh, the working title now is Welcome to the Jungle, keeping with the 80s rock and roll connection there. Yeah. Uh, so, And that's going to be more about failures and why projects fail. And it's sort of, sort of building on what I talk about in the final countdown, but this is getting more into failures and really dissecting why the failures happen and what it means to projects that want to avoid failure. And what would be the key message to your to our audience today around that? that second book and that topic, what would you want to get out there? Well, I think a lot of the themes that we sort of pulled on or the threads we pulled on here today, you know, the, the realistic expectations, the focus on people, the focus on your leadership, um, inevitably, whenever you look at these failures, those are all the things that are missing. I mean, you, you rattled off several of them a, a little while ago in this conversation, and it's building on a lot of those things, plus change management, plus how to get your business processes aligned. We've talked a lot in this discussion around performance measures and business value, customer experience, that sort of thing. Having that North Star to guide you, that's another failure point in the cases that fail, and it's a success point for the ones that that succeed. And I think the main message of the book and the main premise is going to be this isn't rocket science. Nothing you and I are talking about is that crazy or or difficult to understand, but it's it's just the problem is, is you and I talking right now to get a hundred people from a big, massive corporation to agree with what you and I just said, that's a whole nother story. The listeners here today, hopefully right. agree or pick up some things they, they, they agree with here, but, um, you know, convincing an organization and educating an organization is, is a lot more difficult. So that's really what I hope is that the book exposes some of that and helps educate people that are wanting to be successful and learn from the mistakes of the past. Yeah, that all makes sense. I, I think I recall when I reviewed one of your recent posts on this topic that, and it kind of outlines some of the characteristics you just mentioned. I think one thing that, that I noticed that I think is a really interesting sort of shift, because really when you look at it, I mean, you and I have been in this industry for a fairly long time, but it's fair to say we probably had a little more hair than when we started out. Right. Um, that, um, or a little less, I guess. So, so the, the thing that I see the biggest shift, because all these things pretty much are the same people, process, technology, whatever. I think the data issue has gotten more urgent. I think that's the one I would pick that has changed the most, in my opinion, where in the past, you could kind of get away a little with a little more of a tolerance for data silos and data platform issues. I don't think so anymore. I think so much of achieving value out of your investments in technology these days comes back to a smart data strategy. And I think the one thing I really do welcome about AI is that it forces a readiness conversation around what you're doing with your data. And to me, that's the big winner as far as like, that's really taken a jump in my view from where it was 20 years ago. I agree. And it's not just data migration either. It's data governance, uh, master yep. data management, and just the processes behind maintaining that data, produce, creating new data, analyzing the data, all that stuff. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, and a lot of it too, when you think about it, is like, in theory, data should be a real asset for you, right? Because customers are opting in if they trust you. And ideally, there's a trusted opt-in relationship there where I share more about myself with you, therefore you deliver more value to me. That That's how it really should work. Unfortunately, in the land we live in, it's mostly us being strip-mined by surveillance corporations to leverage our uh, dependency on their brands in order to get what we want, which is, <laughs> I think, a pretty right. diabolical state of affairs. But in but in theory, there should be a pure way of doing this that that is more about trust and delivering mutual value. And to me, data becomes part of the arbiter of that value. And and I hope that the customers will look at that. But in the context of everything else, it's not like it it's more important than the other factors. But I do think the data issue has been forced a lot more these days. And and so now I think you do have to really have a hard look, for example, at do I need real-time data in my, in my company and, and under what circumstances? And, you know, I'm still a big fan of this whole right time phrase around like not everything needs to be real-time all the time, right? Like maybe really you need to be reviewing your 
your your sales revenue from your various locations once a week at this point in time rather than every day. Like at some point that daily deluge becomes overwhelming. But I do think we have to have those conversations now and figure out what that right time is and where we're screwing that up and then figure out how can we help people embrace that? Because again and again, what you find is that data can also at its best bring a certain objectivity and light to conversations. People don't always want that. (laughs) They don't always want to be scrutinized in that way. So you have to figure out how to do it in a way that is humane, but also smart. I think those are really interesting conversations. And I, I suppose you probably have those a lot with clients, but yeah, and it it's also uh, if you think about it, you know today's cloud and SaaS based environment, data is really all you own. You don't own the software. That's you, you've got your cloud vendor providing that. You don't know, you don't own the infrastructure. You don't own anything except for the data. So it really is about IP protection, and, and this is more for like the CFO types and the general counsel types in the room. But that's the way you've got to think about it. Is like how do we protect our IP? Data data cleansing, data governance is not a techie thing. That's not a technology thing. That's a that's an IP. Um, competitive advantage sort of thing. And that's the way organizations should be thinking about it. So I, I totally agree that data has really emerged as a, as a top trend or a top uh, success factor for these projects. Well, Eric, that was that was friggin' fire. Um, the, the hour went by really fast. Uh, we're going to wrap in a sec. So audience members, if you have a final comment, snarky aside, act now, because uh, we're about to wrap. Uh, so, so Eric, what, you talked about what you're looking for this fall. Any Any other things you want to share in terms of Anything that you're preoccupied with now in your research? Yeah, I mean, uh, just finishing this book and any of the research is sort of an ongoing thing. You know, I'm constantly trying to understand why these projects are failing and to use your words, why the hell did this happen? How the hell did they let that happen? Just trying to analyze that and, and understand and learn from as much as we can. And, and um, you know, learning from our clients too, I actually have sort of gone backwards a little bit. And as we've grown, I've become less involved in day-to-day consulting, but I'm actually trying to get more involved in day-to-day consulting just because I learned so much with how fast technology is changing. I'm trying to get a, a sense of where are our clients, especially the bigger ones, where are they at? Well, how do we meet them where they are and help them get to where they want to be? So I think that's, um, you know, the, the beauty of what we do, what you and I do and everyone listening here today is this, this stuff changes so fast. I don't think you could possibly ever get bored in this industry. There's always always something to learn. So there's nothing earth shattering or one time learning event I'm looking for. It's more just an ongoing ongoing journey. No, I'm definitely not bored. I'm, it's, I get agitated, but not bored. I guess that's good. Uh, <laughs> right. Jason says ERP transformation success is optional. Ouch, Jason. Um, I, I'd like to think we forged a little bit of ground on that today, but uh, yeah. And Thomas says uh, success is project completion. Then I can move on and stuff up the next customer. Oh my God! Wow. N- nice oh, rebuttals snarky. from the from the legacy crowd here. <laughs> oh right. crap, man. Uh, well, I hope we can all collectively do better, but thanks to the group chat, you guys definitely made this conversation smarter today. So much appreciate that. And Eric, it's always great to catch up with you, man. And we should definitely, every time we do this, we should be like, we should do this more often, but we should definitely do this we'll more often. We you're, should. you're, you're like, like almost like the perfect foil for my, uh, for my, um, rants and stuff, because you can kind of be like, well, this is what I'm seeing. And that's just fabulous. So thanks for the dialogue. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I look forward to seeing you next week, too. Yeah, no doubt. Vegas, dude. See you in a little bit. Bye, everyone. Right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. All right. Off we go.